We want really professional coaches, so we pay them, um, but we don't overstaff. We have these coaches coaching a lot so we can develop and grow them. It's so much easier to grow a coach 10,000 hours, right? Yeah. It's so much easier to grow a coach that's coaching three or four hours a day than is coaching, developing a coach that's coaching three or four hours a week. Right. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run. Always chasing, never stop. Hello, gentlemen. Patrick. Well. <laughs> uh, we, have a, we have a guest today, and it is uh, usually our rules for guests are they have, either have to be married to Ben or they have to have won the CrossFit Games, Ugh. but we're going to break those rules today. I wouldn't um, marry Ben. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> why, why don't you introduce yourself real quick? Uh, my name is Max Isaac. And who are you? I am uh, the co-owner of CrossFit Tilt. Right on. So that is uh, roughly what we're going to talk about today, which is uh, CrossFit Tilt. Um, is a uh, a gym? What do you guys call it? Do you call it a? a, a it's not a franchise. It's a, yeah, it's a gym. Do you call it? It's an uh, it's a few gyms. Okay, so we're going to talk about that today. So let's get a little bit of context to what CrossFit Tilt is. So Ben, maybe you can talk to us um, and maybe throw it to Max whenever it's appropriate mm -hmm. um, about what CrossFit Tilt is um, and maybe how it began. We can start there. Sure. So started obviously with CrossFit New England. Um, that was the baby. That was the incubator. That was where it started. That's where I met Max. Max was a member. Um, and then became one of our coaches. After five years of coaching, um, we went into business together and we opened up CrossFit Tilt. We opened up one of them, um, weren't really well. We opened up a second of them, went really well. We opened up a third of them and now we're in the plans of opening up two more. Mm, very cool. Um, I know, uh, because I know you as well as I do, I know that you have had the opportunity to open more gyms than just CrossFit New England or beyond CrossFit New mm -hmm. England for a long, long time. You've had um, upwards of 20 gyms come out, you know, come out of CrossFit New England in some yeah. way, shape or form, right? Um, and some number of them probably asked you to come and help them in some way to do so. Uh, this CrossFit Tilt is the first one that you've, um, you have done that. You have mm -hmm. taken a, an active role. Uh, in the development um, and the growth of the gym. So maybe tell us a little bit about why, or what about this opportunity seemed interesting to you when the other ones maybe didn't? Yeah, so that's actually, um, I don't know if the number is actually 20 just yet, but it is, I know for a fact it's over 15. So 15 gyms have opened up from within my coaching staff or my membership at CrossFit New England, which is a number I'm really proud of. Yeah. It's, um, that's really, it's really, um, that's helping to establish and change the world. And obviously people are, um, are motivated to become, make this an even bigger part of their lives. So it's really cool that that's happened. Um, some of those that have opened up have asked me to, if I would like to be a part of the business going forward. And I've said, I did say no to every one of them because I didn't believe that culture was scalable. Mm. I didn't believe that what I was doing at Crossman could be replicated somewhere else. And my thought was, what I'm doing is building a family here. And if I open up a if I open up a second family, <laughs> yeah. if there's a second family, like I'm now I'm like two halves are not better than one whole, yep. right? We have that saying, it's better to do a half ass, a kick ass half yep. than a half assed whole. Yep. And more is not better. And you know, I really wanted this th one thing I was really proud of. The reason that I jumped on board with Max is um, the team that I was gonna be a part of. Yep. It was Max and another one of our members, um, LJ, um, to Carlo, who is our third partner in the business. And when they came to me, it just made a lot of sense. Um, the ask that they were looking for for me was not to be a part of the daily operations. It was to help um, with uh, the consulting of the startup, um, to help with the branding, to help uh, figure out some of the systems and the hiring and um, kind of the, the layout of the gym. So it was really more of a um, a, um, it was a lower pull mm -hmm. and it was not an ongoing day to day. So because of that, and because I felt confident with the team that they could, they could replicate what we've created at New England without me, because I had so much faith in Max and truthfully, like he's blown me out of the water since, like mm -hmm. even as much faith I had, um, he super exceeded all of that. Um, that's what led me to believe that this was the right opportunity to do this. And I haven't said yes to one since either. Right, this right. is, this is it. Um, Max, uh, so how much of the development of Tilt went on before you guys went to talk to Ben? 
So, um, and before that, I think I don't think we've mentioned it, but you trained here at CrossFit New England for quite a bit of quite a bit of time, which is I think why Ben started or had the trust in you even to begin with. Um, so I think that's important context. To, you know, you weren't a stranger, and you you showed no. Ben a, a business plan, and he was wowed by it. Right. So there was a lot of there was a relationship there that you got that was already being built. But even on top of that, what was it that you brought to him that made him finally say yes to an opportunity like this? So. We came to Ben really early on. In fact, um, LJ and I had the idea to open a gym. And the biggest thing that I wanted to do was to be upfront and honest with Ben about what was going on. So uh, to kind of speak to what you were talking about, I had um, been a member at CrossFit New England for a while. And like I think everybody kind of gets bit by the CrossFit bug. And I decided at the time uh, to start trying to make a go at being a coach. And Ben has given me a number of opportunities throughout the year, uh, throughout the year, excuse me, throughout like my whole coaching career and eventually became a full-time coach for Ben. And like Ben saying, I had seen a lot of people open up gyms, but not a lot of people had continued to have Ben be a part of it. And mm. for me, Ben has played a number of roles in my life. Uh, he has been my coach. He's uh, been like pretty much, you know, my manager, but also he's been a huge mentor for me and somebody that I've looked up to for a number of years and continue to look up to. So it was incredibly important once we dreamed up the idea of a gym that I came to Ben immediately. And that's what LJ and I did. We came to Ben with the idea of opening a gym and with pretty much just like a picture of what we wanted the gym to look like. Mm -hmm. And that but was- But the picture was It was insane. Cool. <laughs> so, so the picture, the, the first gym we built was from the ground right. up. So, it's a, I think it was, it, to my knowledge, actually, and I'm definitely going to be wrong about this, but it was the first gym, CrossFit gym, I had ever seen or heard of that was built for the purpose of becoming a yeah. CrossFit gym. So just we're that- converting a building into a CrossFit Exactly. Gym. We're yeah. literally like cracking ground, like putting in a foundation and building this thing from the ground up with the sole purpose of turning it into a CrossFit gym. That in and of itself was an exciting opportunity. And um, LJ's- got kind of a flair for aesthetics and mm -hmm. um he's he does things really really well so again like the opportunity in the team was really exciting mm -hmm. yeah so we uh we came to ben early on and wanted him to be a part of it and luckily he said yes and so that gave me a lot of confidence moving forward because as i'm sure people who are listening who are affiliate owners the beginning super scary. In mm -hmm. fact, one thing that I remember all the time is when we just had the bare bones of the building, LJ and Ben sat me down in my office and there was, you know, like a couple of paint buckets and sat me down and like, all right, like this is going to succeed or fail because of you. Like now's the time to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And the really cool thing is, is that throughout my career working with Ben, We've had that conversation a number of times. Mm -hmm. We started a high school class with uh, my good friend Jeff. And Ben said to send to us that day, he's like, hey, you guys can do whatever you want. I have faith that you're going to run this program well, but it's going to succeed because of you. And it could fail because of you. And to me, that motivates me. That mm -hmm. gets me excited. It makes me super fired up. So, um, You said something earlier about uh, one of the reasons why you didn't say yes to opportunities like this before is because you weren't sure that culture scaled. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you can maybe uh, talk about that a little bit, what what you meant by that. And then were you wrong or is there is this a special case where you where it did scale or like how did you how have you navigated that sort of that challenge? Yeah. So my, my fear was that, um, you know, creating a, creating a culture you're proud of is hard. It's a it's a complete investment um, from a 360 degree approach. It's not a matter of just putting in the systems. It's not about having the right building. It's not even a matter of like hiring the right coaches. It's about you're, you're literally developing a personality. You are raising a child and that child has a certain personality to it. That is what the culture of your business is. And it takes so much to get that to where you want it to be. So much so that I didn't think it was possible to do it somewhere else mm -hmm. where I wasn't as invested in. Mm -hmm. I took the leap on um, the, the tilt opportunity because I've never been around somebody that can do it um, better than me, mm -hmm. except for Max. Mm -hmm. He's the guy, and this is why this is why it was an exciting opportunity. Um, he's the ringleader. He's the guy that at CF&E, um, if there was a social and Max was involved, everybody was there. Like 
the stupidest ideas ever were like the best ideas <laughs> ever because Max was the ringleader. There was like a chicken wing eating contest. If I was to get people riled up for a chicken wing contest, nobody would be there. <laughs> but for whatever reason, he has a skill set where he is like the the um when Max asks you to do something, it's really easy to do it. And because he has that leadership quality, and leadership comes in a lot of different forms. Um, he's a very different leader than I am. Um, and I envy the the ability he has to rally troops. Um, because he had that, that's what gave me the confidence that this would be an opportunity to kind of jump on. Mm -hmm. Um, where, where does that come from for you, Max? Is that something that you, is just natural to you in terms of that ability, that, that sort of, uh, ability to be a leader and to be in front of people and to, and to fire people up for lack of a better term, is that just who you are? Or is that something that you've developed over the years of being a coach and, and being in a leadership position, sort of stepping up to that? I think it's twofold. I think that there is definitely something innately inside me, which is obviously innately inside Ben, inside of people that lead other people. I think there's something inside that motivates me. But to be quite honest with you, um, a lot of it is Ben showing me how it's supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. So when I came on at Tilt, or excuse me, at CFNE, however many years ago, Ben poured everything he had into me, into the other coaches, into the members. I saw it every single day. I was lucky enough to compete for Ben on uh, on a couple of the teams. And to be quite honest with you, I wasn't a super high level competitor, but I wanted it so bad. And what I really wanted was everything that he was able to give me and leading from example all the time. It's honestly the smallest things. One thing that has always stuck in my head, and this sounds so silly, is Ben would be like, are you the person that when you walk into the bathroom is gonna walk past a paper towel on the ground? I know this sounds so silly, but like that has stuck with me forever. He's like, no, you're the person that will pick that up and put it away. And I know that sounds like like minutia, like so small, but like that type of thing, attention to detail and taking so much pride in what you do is what Ben has shown me is the only way to do it, which is lead from the front always and as creepy as this sounds, like everybody's always watching you. So just mm -hmm. make it the best it can be all the time. So I think it's two things, you know? Yeah, as we're as we're talking about this, um, it's so funny. Like I didn't realize this, but a lot of this um, and some of the stuff we talked about years ago, um, but it's all coming back in um, oh, I'm blanking on him. Um, the guy that opened up Shake Shack and Union Square Cafe and um, um, Danny Myers. Danny Myers, thank you. Yes. Oh my um, um <laughs> He's um, talked about how you scale culture and servant yeah. leadership and all those things. And it's so funny you're talking about that. Um, he talks about the same thing. Like the leader is the one that picks up the trash. The leader is the one. And he was so afraid of opening up a second restaurant because he said you can't scale culture. Mm -hmm. And then he figured out how to do it by surrounding yourself with really good people. One of the things as Max was talking about that is like, um, you know, we sat down. I remember these conversations. Sat down with Max in the office on flipped upside down paint, you know, five gallon mm -hmm. buckets and had these really, um, you know, passionate, you know, eye to eye conversations about, you know, this is gonna succeed or fail with you and him taking complete ownership of that going forward. But those are like the, the heartfelt real, those would build the trust and those would built up the leadership and those would built up eventually the results that we have is those hard conversations. Max at one point was a full-time employee for us and then wasn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's I I'm really happy you brought that up because that moment for me changed my life. So once I became a coach, my goal was like I have to become a full-time coach at CrossFit New England. Like this is like this is what I'm going to set out to do. And it initially started with I had coaching duties, but then I got to work the front desk and I you know, Ben will tell you, I was like, I'll do anything and I'm going to be the best at working the front desk. And now my stalking skills are still really <laughs> good. And I, you know, I take a lot of pride in stalking my front desk at Tilt still yep. to this day, stalking my bathrooms. Eventually, it led to some more uh, responsibilities. And I was just so psyched that I was a full time coach that I probably was not doing a great job. And by probably mean I probably definitely wasn't doing a great job because then we had one of those really hard conversations where Ben sat me down and said, you know, you're no longer going to be a full time coach here. And that that was it. It's not I don't want you here. Mm -hmm. It's not that I don't like you. It was the facts that 
You can no longer be a full-time coach. These are still going to be your classes. And pretty much like the ball's in your court, make a decision. Mm -hmm. And that day I realized, I'm like, if this was the old me, I would have walked out. But instead, I'm like, check, let's go. Like, I am now going to be the best coach ever. At that time, we had the 7.30 p.m. class that was a smaller class. Yeah, for sure. And my goal, I'm like, I'm going to make this the ultimate class in the class that everybody wants to come to. And I did. I built that class up to be something really, really special. So that's the class that went to the chicken wing eating contest. <laughs> yeah. For real. Yeah. It was like they, yeah. they were like, they were Max's like little, like they were. A it was team. great. Yeah. Yeah. And so like Ben says, the hard conversations are the best conversations. And he has had a number of tough conversations with me, whether it be about coaching, whether it be about really my own fitness. Like I can remember multiple times, like Ben, I want to be a competitor. He's like, cool, stop drinking chocolate milk. You probably need to start doing the zone. So what did I do? I did the zone for a year and a half, you know? And you, I mean, you got shredded, yeah. like shredded was, from that. It was great. So almost every hard conversation that I had have, have with Ben always yields amazing results. And that's where we're at right now, which is we have three tilt gyms and they're running really well. Um, before we keep going, just just to add a little context, because I'm not sure I totally understand the, the story about not being a full time coach anymore. That was because you were because why it was at a time, I think, when the ECC was going on, mm -hmm. I was in charge of doing some copy stuff. And I really don't think that either I wasn't doing the best job or that it was really needed for me to be a full time coach. And I think and I'm sure Ben can speak this better that. It was more like, okay, you're going to become a part-time coach. It was essentially like looking at the the organization. We had a couple people, Max being one of them, that were full-time coaches that were not fulfilling the roles and responsibilities gotcha. of a full-time coach. So it was not that he was a bad coach. It was that the extra stuff that he was responsible for wasn't enough to justify a full-time salary. Gotcha. So we had the conversation about it makes more sense for you, Max. You might not see it right now, and this might look like you're getting a demotion or something else. I'm telling you, it's not. It's gonna make more sense. You're gonna have more opportunities if you're a part-time coach. If you just coach these one or two classes a day, and now you have the opportunity to build a business on the side, invest into you as a coach, the business on the side being personal training, yep. invest in yourself as a coach, this is an opportunity for you to grow and do so much more. We're pigeonholing you. We're having you at the front desk and working these administrative positions when you should be a coach and growing as a coach. Mm. And now, as he said, a younger, more immature Max would have seen that and heard that and be like, screw this place. Who's he think he is? I'm out of here. The more mature and grown up Max that had been you know, with us for, for three, four years at that time took that as a, what it was, a challenge. Mm -hmm. Who can you be as a coach? And flipped that upside down and said, I'm going to build this class into the best damn class in the whole gym and he did and that's why two years later when he came to me with the business opportunity of hey we're gonna open up a gym would you like to be a part of it i was like, yeah, i've seen what you've done mm -hmm. i know what you can do i know how you can lead people yeah i want to be a part of that um so uh, that's great i'm glad i asked for that clarification because that makes that story so much better um <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, stories are so much better when you understand, when you understand them, them. <laughs> yeah. um so I'd love to talk, ask you guys both about, and we've we've talked about it a little bit before, about um, there are some people who are really good coaches and really good leaders, but aren't necessarily uh, the right people to open a business, right? To be entrepreneurs. Yeah, for sure. Um, everything so far sounded like you were a great coach, possibly a great head coach, possibly a great leader, a great role model, but that doesn't necessarily mean you had all the tools necessary to run a gym by yourself effectively, even though you had partners, you were like, you, like you've already said, it was on your shoulders, right? So I'm curious, was that a leap to you? Did it feel like a leap to you to go from, I'm gonna make a really good 7.30 class to I'm gonna have 12 of those and be responsible for the lights going on and off every night? Were you ready for that? Did you see that, that he was capable of that? Was that never an issue? Or does it always felt like he's the right guy to do that? Um, and that's the end of my question. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer my part quick and let yeah. Max take a stab at this. Um, I had huge questions. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, cause I, what you said is exactly right. I knew he could lead a group of, um, you know, 15 to 30 people in a class. Um, beyond that, 
you know, we let him go when he had responsibilities outside of that. Right. So yeah, <laughs> huge question marks. Yeah. <laughs> but I felt confident in the team that we had. Yep. And even more so, I felt comfortable in Max being a coachable partner. Yep. And that was what really excited me. I, Max, he'll probably be this, but um, when I would present um, business seminars, Max is probably of all of our coaches been to more of them than anybody else. And when he's there, he's so eager and excited about what we're talking about. When I would have those hard conversations, as hard as they are, it always came back like double fold on the positive side later on. Mm -hmm. So the fact that he was so coachable is what excited me. And the fact that we had a strong team from myself on the, the gym side, from LJ on the finance side, and from Max on the ringleader side. Yep. Got it. What do you think? Yeah, I I agree with Ben. The, the team's everything. We have a phenomenal team. Um, I'll be honest with you. I'm not super business savvy. Mm -hmm. um, I, like Ben said, had sat in on every single Business of Excellence seminar. I've listened to Ben. I've watched Ben for a number of years. So I thought I had a pretty good idea of what it took to run a gym. I didn't really have a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, but the really wonderful thing is that I'm always, like Ben said, I'm up for a challenge. And because we have LJ on one end, literally handing the, fin the finance side, and I can always talk to Ben if I need him, for me, it's just about selling out every single day. And we're three years in, and this gym is my baby. Mm -hmm. And I am giving it everything I can possibly give. And in the beginning, I was coaching every class. So yeah, like it was okay. You just drink 12 cups of coffee during the day, <laughs> and you coach every single but class. But that's what, and Max was so hungry. Yeah. Like literally, like um, when we're trying to like peel him off and hire more people and coach, like get other people to coach classes. I mean, it's like, it's like trying to take duct tape off a floor that's been there for six years. It's yeah. like, it doesn't come off. Like yeah. he's like, no, I, I really want to be there when it opens up. I want to greet every member that walks in. And here's the thing that gave me confidence is for people I've been to the business seminar or this is new to people is the way I think about developing a business, whether that's, um, you know, you're gonna open up, create a shoe company or you're gonna open up a gym, it starts with a culture you're creating. And that culture, yes, in a gym, it matters in terms of like, what is the feel, the vibe for the members, but it starts with your team. Max is so good at that, right? So if you can lay the foundation super strong and then we can, I come in with some systems and LJ's there to support, but it, all like the operations and the beautiful facilities and the nice um, equipment and knowing how to create a schedule and um, class formatting, none of that matters if you don't have the culture. Mm -hmm. And Max was the guy of all the people I've ever worked at I felt supremely confident in that. So if you bring in the culture side of it, the rest can kind of like get layered on top. Mm -hmm. But without that foundation, I mean, we're not, we're not, talk we're not sitting here talking about this. So like we, um, we've been able to scale it too. We've been opening up we're on our third, we're going on five. Um, the third one we had, like it's it's in a, um, a corporate facility. And the goal was to get to like, the, the corporation that we were working with, was the goal was to be super psyched if they had, um, was it 100 members in the first year? It was 100 members in, in one year and we're at- 170 in six months. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like we're, it's, the thing we've created is working. It's mm -hmm. working really well. Mm -hmm. um, how have you, Max, uh, scaled the culture just within Tilt? So there was the, the one transfer of culture from yeah. Ben to Tilt, right? But now it's up to you together, but up to you quite a bit to make sure that the culture doesn't uh, disintegrate when you leave one facility and go to the next one and then go to the fifth one and the eighth one. What are, what are you guys doing to make sure that it doesn't get diluted just within the brand? So it's identifying a lot of the things that Ben has always talked to me about. And again, like there are these little like tidbits that always stick in my mind. And one thing that Ben has always talked to me about, he's like, when I'm looking to hire a coach, he's like, I need to make sure that I could ride in the car with them for three or four hours. And above all, I really believe that that helps me so much in identifying who are going to be awesome coaches, mm -hmm. right? These are people that you want to be around and you want to be around them for a number of reasons, right? Like one, there's something between you two that is in common. The other thing is like three or four hours, this person can also talk. Mm -hmm. So it means they can probably like lead a class. They also want to be around other people. So because of that, and this is 
where I'm continuing to learn, which is how to develop coaches. And developing coaches is incredibly difficult. And I'm sure Ben would agree with this. Like we're constantly learning the best way to do it. Hmm. But we have right now at Tilt uh, seven coaches and they're all phenomenal in their own right. And they're all different. And the really nice thing is that I'm involved with all of our coaches and giving them feedback all the time, talking with them all the time, taking class with them all the time. So I'm, I'm around the coaches a lot. Let's, let's, can you speak to that a little bit? That sounds really crazy that seven coaches, um, but we have three, three thriving gyms. How does that work? We coach a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so he said 12 cups of coffee. Remember? Yeah. 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 So yeah. on top, but in terms of like, I think that when, um, if people that I, cause I know that I, I talk to a lot of affiliate owners and when I talk to them, most of them are struggling to get to from that hundred number to that 150 and more are struggling from 150 to 200. Yet, even when they have a hundred members, they might have four five or six coaches. Yeah. Now we have three gyms with hundreds and hundreds of members across all of them, yet there's only seven coaches. How does that work? So um, the way that it works is that we all really love to coach. Um, I love to coach. So for instance, today's Tuesday, I will coach four classes today at the Waltham gym out of the seven classes that we offer. So I still coach a lot. At every gym, we have a pillar coach. So I am considered the pillar coach in Waltham. Uh, Brian Sieber is our pillar coach in Sudbury and Sean Tully is our pillar coach in Wellesley. We have three, what I believe is really, really strong head coaches. And we have a number of young coaches that are so hungry and want to coach. And I, I get it. Maybe the word hungry is overused. It's not when it applies to these people. They really want to coach and they want to get better. So because of that, it's it's really easy because we all want to coach two to three classes a day. And because of that, we've been able to operate these businesses a lot leaner than a lot of other gyms are doing. They're overstaffing and payroll is already, you know, 50% of expenses, if not more for these gyms. And they're making even higher than it should be. You can run these, this is our take, you can run these gyms extremely lean. Um, we put a lot of money into the infrastructure. So it takes a little while for us to pay it back mm -hmm. because we want it to be a good, user experience when they walk in, they want to look like it's a tilt gym. That's something that the members are proud of. We want really professional coaches, so we pay them, um, but we don't overstaff. We have these coaches coaching a lot so we can develop and grow them. It's so much easier to grow a coach, 10,000 hours, right? Yeah. It's so much easier to grow a coach that's coaching three or four hours a day than is coaching, developing a coach that's coaching three or four hours a week. Right. Right. Yeah, and especially if they're within your system while they do it. So it's it's not only yeah. the hours of doing it, but it's the hours of doing it right as you guys see. So Max, maybe speak a little bit about what are some of the, the, the protocols you put in place in developing coaches? So we, first off, you're hiring pe young people that are hungry, that want to coach. But are there other ways that we're kind of um, practices we're putting in place to further the development? Yeah, so one thing that I do on a pretty regular basis, in fact, sometimes daily is go over lesson plans with my coaches. So I'm pretty much at the gym all the time, except for right now, cause I'm doing this awesome <laughs> podcast. Um, but I'm, I'm at the gym all the time. Mm -hmm. So I got there this morning at 4:45. I'll leave tonight at 7:45 at night. Um, we're three years in, I'm working 12 to 15 hour days and I can honestly say loving every minute of it, but because I'm there that much, I'm watching the coaches coach. I'm, able to see how they're coaching and giving them feedback. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a scheduled time. I, you know, I have a half an hour right now to go over with you, but it's more like after the class, Hey, I saw you did this really well. What about this? And just asking like, is there a different way we could do this? But then more formally, something that we've been doing recently is on a monthly basis, getting together the CrossFit New England and tilt coaches together to do um, coaching development, group workouts, and really just freaking bonding. And um, it's something that before the podcast, I was talking to Ben, he told me, stop talking about it. But um, <laughs> when we used to do team training with Ben, we could be there for five hours. And at the time, I just thought like, oh, this is what everybody does. It doesn't happen everywhere. <laughs> and, and Ben would give us everything. So forget like the coaching side of 2159 thrusters pull-ups. He was developing us as people. Like that's what he did. So for me, 
that's what I'm trying to do for my coaches is I want to develop them into being great people because great people are probably also going to be great coaches because great people care and great people love their people. Right. And that's, Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, I know Ben definitely agrees with that. Like that's, that helps, Mm -hmm. you know, like if your coaches actually love the people that they're coaching, they're probably going to be great. I just want to, I want to pull two things out that because I don't want these things to go by because I hope um, I, I just want to highlight two things. The first one is Max talked about um, there. It's not the formality. It and this is something we used to have formal quarterly reviews at CrossFit New England where we would sit down every ninety days and go over this is how, where your strengths, this is your weaknesses. I remember, right and it. it um, they suck. Mm-hmm. They're terrible. Like it's awkward for both sides. Nobody likes it. It's not an enjoyable experience. It's so not the way we operate on a day-to-day basis. I think there's so much magic at the water cooler. And that's what we try to do is make the feedback loop constant. So every single day you're giving feedback of like, this is what went well. This is what didn't. Why would you wait 90 days before you give that feedback? It's just so artificial and stale and it's not the way it happens in real life. Like if if I'm having something going on with my family, I don't wait 90 days to say like, this is the things you're struggling with and let's see if we can pick these up in the next quarter. You have that real time conversation. So what Max is doing is, because he's there all the time, taking and watching the classes, is after the class, giving that real time feedback. And what we we call it the magic at the water cooler, because those little, I think all the magic happens at the fringes. Mm-hmm. It's not in the meeting, it's like, when the meeting ends and you're walking back to this other place, you're having that little conversation, that's where true bonding happens. That's where the real stuff moves forward. And I, I think the bigger the organization, the more magic happens at the water cooler because it's so formal. And the more formal it gets, the less real and authentic it is. The second one is about developing coaches as people. And that is moving from transactional development, which is here's the X's and O's of our sports. Here's how you see and correct. Here's how you manage groups. It's like building a robot to the transformational. Transformational coaching is changing someone as a human being, that it's going to transform them so if they are no longer a part of your organization, they can take that with them because now they're a different type of person. It changes them from the inside out. So the water cooler and transformational, not transactional, are huge, huge key points that we lean deep, deep into all the time. Um, I want to maybe close this conversation with something that uh, feels to me like it underpins so much of what we've been talking about, um, but we haven't touched on it specifically. So I'm, I'm curious what you guys think about um, how much, how important it is to think about and pursue uh, mentors and apprenticeships and use whatever words there you want to use. When you were a coach here, you didn't consider yourself an apprentice, but everything you've been saying it strikes me as exactly what an apprentice would learn or come out of it. So, and then thinking about how you're scaling it, what you're doing is now you're just, you're the mentor to six other, uh, you know, apprentices. So I'm curious, do you think about those things consciously or is it part of, uh, part of your personality? So it was, it was sort of handed down to you and you're taking it or, or, or is it more intentional? So, I think about the mentorship mentorship piece a lot as it pertains to myself in that um, I have two wonderful role models, Ben and LJ. My two business partners are not only my business mentors, I look at them as my life mentors. Um, no father figure in my life at all. I have two amazing father figures who have shown me how things should be done. And this is not about how to balance my checkbook and stuff like this. It's what Ben is talking about, which is deeper than that, which is how to be the best possible person I can be. And I know without a shadow of a doubt, without Ben and LJ, I would definitely be doing something different. I don't think I would be the person that I am today without them. Mm -hmm. So mentorship is huge. So what I'm trying to do is pay it forward, which is... I want to do what Ben and LJ have done for me and continue to do for me for all my young coaches. And the thing is, I I would imagine from Ben and LJ's standpoint, they're not doing anything different. This Mm. is just who they are. They're giving people. They're givers. And I'm a giver at heart too. So because of that, I'm giving my time and I'm there all the time and I'll give them whatever they want. And that's something that Ben has always done for me 
has never had a closed door. If Ben has needed me, he's always been there. Or excuse me, if I've ever needed Ben, he's always been there for mm-hmm. me. Yeah, for me. Um, it's so funny you said that because as you were asking the question, I was like, man, I, I just don't see myself as a mentor. Mm. I see myself as a coach. Mm-hmm. And that's what my job is, is coaching. So when I'm thinking about um, working with our 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 coaches, I'm not like sitting here like I'm a mentor and right. you're gonna like, it's I'm doing my job, which is I'm developing coaches. Like I coach coaches. And when I meet with my class and talk to them about, I'm trying to just like give people what I can give them. That's just a piece that's, of yourself. That's I, what it is. It's not even, I don't even feel like I'm giving a piece of myself. I'm just like, um, cause to me like that's, you don't get that back. I don't know. It's like, I'm, I'm not giving, I'm just trying to share um, something that might make things better. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's it. I'm like, if I think that this might help, Here's an here's something that might help. I have no idea if it will, right? right I'm right. just trying to help. Um, but I also thought of it in terms of um, I have mentors, right? And I um, I have um, people that I lean on for business, whether it's my dad or um, big one I've worked with is is um, Marcus, the guy that started mm-hmm. Noble with um, phenomenal business mind that I would lean on and trust with everything. Um, I think it's super important. I, the mentor word is weird because I think it mentor apprentice all it brings a formality to it, yep. and I think people are like, well, we don't, we haven't said, right. like, it's I haven't changed, my, I haven't changed my stat, my status on Facebook, so maybe we don't have, maybe you're right. not my mentor. Like, are we going steady? Yeah. Like, nah, I, I have put that on. Facebook. Yeah. So it's because of that. It's like I, I think there's a form. It's like um, I have people that I trust that I lean on, um, and I'm just like yesterday. I went to lunch with a person. Um, we're, I'm trying to learn about um, data mining and data analysis. You know, so from Google Analytics to um, finding out about your customers and your users and all that stuff. I don't know anything about it, mm-hmm. so like, I'm not gonna pretend I do. So through one of our members at our gym, I found out about an expert in this, and I went and had lunch with them. And for an hour, I learned so much. It's phenomenal. So to me, like that person is a mentor, but it's like, but I might only meet them one time. Right. So it's like, I don't like the word mentor because it, to me, it's like, you've signed a contract and you've established it, that this is the relationship going forward. I think it's really important just to reach out and lean on and dig into people that you could learn from. And from there, if it makes you better, if you even if you don't take away anything, I think it's hard not to grow from those experiences. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good place to end it. Cool. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Patrick. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Max. Thanks. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.